So, in this um, spirit, um, we have organized the symposium, and uh, in case you haven't had a chance yet, there, there are uh, printed out schedules at the front desk. Um, we'll start with kind of the historic aspect. We, we, have, we were fortunate enough to, to, uh, to find David Egger and bring him here to Yale, and he'll talk to us uh, uh, about kind of staying this microscopy or around the year 1967 and related microscopy development. <laughs> Um, Derek Tormey uh, from the cell biology department will then build a bridge to, uh, to modern uh, uh, microscopy research here at Yale. Uh, we, we then follow uh, with uh, presentations by five microscopy cores here at Yale, uh, giving everyone kind of a, an overview of what microscopy facilities are actually available to everyone's uh, um, um, research here at Yale. Uh, and then after lunch, we, we have 18, uh, what we call them, lightning talks, and short eight-minute presentations by a ju uh, primarily junior research, researchers here at Yale presenting how they use microscopy in their daily research and uh, to, to really give a, a good idea of this multifaceted microscopy um, research going on here at Yale. Uh, during the whole symposium, we have plenty of breaks. We have uh, lunch breaks, we have coffee breaks, and so on. Please use the opportunities to uh, talk to each other, network. Um, at the end of the symposium, uh, at 5 o'clock, we also have kind of a poster session. Please stick around and, and talk to uh, the core facility managers, talk, talk to your fellow postdocs, fellow colleagues here at Yale, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully this, this whole event brings the whole community together. So, um, with uh, now starting kind of with our first uh, introduction to our first talk, uh, David Egger, as I mentioned already, um, has, has, uh, has come here from, from Princeton, where he lives, uh, to talk to us about kind of the uh, kind of earlier uh, times of studying this microscopy. Um, he um, rece received his uh, bachelor's degree in Stanford. We actually studied the double major in physics and humanities. Kind of a very broad horizon uh, person, and as you'll see throughout his uh, CV, uh, and surfaces again and again. Um, he got his uh, PhD then at Yale in 1962, um, followed by a postdoc and a preclinical medicine fellowship here at Yale. And uh, then became a, an instructor and associate professor of anatomy here at uh, Yale University uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he later on uh, moved, uh, uh, in the 70s, he moved on then to the uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, particularly to the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And he, uh, he rose through the ranks to a professor and had uh, several uh, important uh, uh, administrative roles like, like vice chair and, and uh, uh, acting chairman and so on during his career uh, there as well. Um, and during the 1960s, so 50 years ago, 1967, is uh, when he published uh, uh, with uh, Paltran this a sci a paper in science on a new reflected light mic microscope for viewing unstained brain and ganglion cells, which is this the birth uh, of, of the spinning disc microscope, uh, microscope in a, in a, a biologic sense. But uh, this is, was not his only important contribution to science. He has uh, many, many uh, uh, high-profile papers, important papers published over, over the years. And, and what struck me in particular was when I was looking through his paper list was the, the diversity of the papers he published. On one hand, for example, if you just look in one year, 1969, he had a, a Nature paper uh, uh, on the uh, with the title Scanning Laser Microscope, um, so a clear microscope development paper, and in the same year he had a paper called uh, Reappraisal of Reflex Stepping in the Cat. So um, I would say that's a pretty broad uh, uh, range of research you can do. So um, I'm, I'm happy that uh, he could come. I'm also very glad that uh, uh, his family could also join us here today. His wife and uh, his, his, his children are here. Um, and uh, without further ado, I would like to ask you to join me here on the stage, and I would uh, ask everyone to join me, Roger. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's fun to be here to talk. 
You didn't point out that the uh, stepping paper was co-authored with Professor Wyman. <laughs> so yeah, Bob and I collaborated on a lot of, a lot of really fun things. He came. I was in the medical school, and Bob came over uh, looking for a collaborator. Ultimately, found me, and we had a really a lot of fun. Lots of lots of interesting papers. And then eventually, he taught me about flocks. That's that's a whole other world. <laughs> we did. Yeah, we did. We did an analysis of the instrument that was used to give people electroconvulsive shock as we discovered the whole thing was kind of a sham. So that was that was another paper that we published together. Can you can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, all right. So let's get started. Uh, this is the title of the, the conference. And the the whole world of spinning disc microscopy starts with uh, Paul Nipkow <coughs> who grew up in the uh, <coughs> was born and raised in the eastern part of Germany in East Prussia, which is now Poland. And it's interesting that kind of the theme of this whole scanning disc is that most of the major contributors are Central Europeans. It's a Central European story. Anyway, Paul Nipkow is one. He was a uh, rather obscure 19th century uh, engineer. And uh, when he went to Berlin, one of the things that he did <coughs> was design a wheel that could uh, translate telegraph impulses into images. So that was, and he, uh, he did that fairly early in his career when he was 25. <coughs> he invented something called the Nipkow disc. It was, uh, you see, I'm a little bit usually challenged here, so let me see if I can. Yeah, that's better. So he patented <coughs> in, uh, 19, in 1885 uh, the, disc, uh, the Nipkow disc to uh, uh, make possible the transmission of, of images, which for the time was amazing. And uh, what happened to this disc is that it became the heart of early television transmission. And all, virtually all television transmitters in the 20s and 30s were based on uh, the Nipkow disc. So what is it? It's a uh, flat disc with holes evenly spaced and uh, equally sized. Uh, arrayed in an uh, Archimedean uh, spiral, and uh, it rotates, and because of the rotation and the placement of the holes, it's possible to you shine light through it to illuminate the image. In a television, you illuminate at one end, then translate into electrical impulses, and then have a disc at the other end, so you need two discs. Anyway, this is a, a, an illustration <coughs> of a Nipkow disc. And this is uh, Petron's version of it. Of it. It's a little bit more complicated than the one that uh, Paul Lipkoff himself used. I'm going to talk a lot about one of Petron's. So anyway, this is he gets credit for it. this version of the of the Lipkoff. So, in doing the research for this talk, I discovered something uh, that I thought was interesting. Uh, the first tele public television uh, station in the world. Was called Fernsey Center Television Station. Paul Nipkow, this was based on Nipkow. It was uh, built by the Germans or the Nazis, however you won't think about 1935 Germany. It was built uh, to uh, transmit images of the 1936 Olympics. And the, the, rate of, the range of transmission wasn't very far. It was Berlin and environs, but 150 or 160,000 people were estimated to be able to watch the events at the 1936 Olympic on uh, the Hall of the Club. Anyway, it existed until 1944. So that's Nipkow. We have the disc. The next major person uh, in the history of the uh, confocal scanning disc microscopy is actually Marvin Minsky. And probably those of you who know about Marvin Minsky, which I presume in this class is just better than right? Think of him as the father and for his long life, he, he died of 11 two years ago. The guru of artificial intelligence. Yeah, absolutely right, same guy. So, uh, interestingly enough, he had most of his career at MIT, but he did his uh, doctoral studies in, uh, he got his PhD in mathematics at Princeton. And while he was at Princeton, he got interested in the brain. And he wanted to try to figure out a way to 
make observations on the brain, which is kind of a side issue. But following his PhD at Princeton, he was offered uh, to be a member of the Society of Fellows at Harvard, which is a very prestigious thing. And so you get two years to do what you want. And in those two years, he invented the confocal microscope. He uh, got bits and pieces of this and that, and uh, with the idea that he was going to look at, at the, the brain and brains of animals. Anyway, he, uh, he wrote a, a memoir about this, which was published in uh, 1988 in Scanning, uh, in scanning, uh, scanning Journal. And I like this, it begins uh, with modestly saying, this is what I remember about inventing the confocal scanning microscope in 1955, which is right. Anyway, this is, this is it. This is, this is the illustration from uh, Minsky's patent, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, okay, so we have a pinhole here, and a pinhole here, and a light going through lenses and illuminating the object. This is it, folks. This is the confocal microscope. Everything else is commentary. Uh, <laughs> anyway, this is from his patent. This is actually Minsky's microscope. He hooked the microscope, he, he had to kind of ideas of using it as a biological instrument. Uh, he hooked it up to, I don't think any of you probably too young to remember, long persistence oscilloscopes where the oscilloscope uh, uh, being uh, illuminated the, the screen for quite a long time. That's as far as he went. He didn't bother to make any photographs or anything like that. But he did take some, some pictures of biological type of objects and he packed it the microscope and then he went on to get artificial intelligence. So, so that's, that's uh, <laughs> Minsky's sort of by glow during the two years he was a junior fellow before he became Mark Minsky. Uh, okay, look, uh, this leads us to Petron. I've mentioned that the hip cog wheel that we looked at was actually a version of Petron uh, uh, built. And uh, Roger Petron uh, was born in 1923, he's now 94, which is why he's not going to be in the talk. Uh, <laughs> Because the scanning disk microscope really is, is his, his baby. Anyway, so uh, to tell you a little bit about him, uh, I looked up the sort of standard references, and it says he was a member of the resistance during World War II. That's a boulderization. That's a, uh, a euphemism. He was a member of the Communist Party, and very early on, and when he, yeah, I first met him in the 1960s, he introduced himself to me as a little red devil, which in the <laughs> 60s I thought was a uh, anyway, uh, he was a graduate of the Faculty of Medicine at Charles University of Prague, uh, studied uh, electrophysiology. Uh, began in 1960 uh, working in medical physics the Faculty of Medicine in Pilsen. And Pilsen is where he had his, essentially his whole career. Uh, became a professor of, of uh, well, biophysics uh, in Pilsen. He was the co-author of a very influential book that was published in the 1960s on electrophysiological methods and biological research. And this is Petronic, he's the little one, little one uh, in this illustration, <laughs> sort of man, receiving the decoration. This was in 2005, he was decorated uh, uh, with a medal uh, by the then president of the Czech Republic, Václav Havel, who's the cytotron. Anyway, this is, this is Petronic. Uh, and he was decorated uh, for his uh, achievements, largely related to the scanning, uh, panel scanning microscopy. Uh, his collaborator, long-term collaborator and junior protege and, and, uh, and uh, buddy, uh, much younger, Milan Drosky. So the two of them worked together uh, on the on the uh, panel scanning microscope. And this is their patent, uh, which they patented. For the, for the virus. This is the U.S. patent, a Czechoslovakian patent uh, application it was a year or so early. This is 1967. Uh, these are illustrations from the, uh, from the patent. The top one uh, showing the location of the, uh, the disk. The bottom one, a uh, more complex uh, drawing of the microscope. The details aren't important, but anyway, this, this is, was, was their baby. The next person that's involved in this gets now into the Yale uh, angle. This is Robert Malamis. I don't know, uh, in, uh, in his day, very famous scientist. 
he, in his early days, uh, was the person who demonstrated that bats uh, navigate by echolocation. He did the electrophysiological study. Very, very important. He made him very famous. He's very excised. Anyway, uh, he did a lot of other stuff. He was in Walter Reed for a long time. And then uh, in, the, in the middle of the 60s, Yale recruited him and came to Yale. And so he had actually just arrived at Yale not long uh, before uh, I, I started on the faculty. I joined the faculty in 1965. And uh, we were, we knew each other, and we were chatting, and we began talking about about the being able to visualize brain cells. This is the light motif that was mentioned in the introduction. It's the light motif through all of this. The, the desire to see living cells, especially living brain cells, has been motivating uh, the, these development, motivated these developments in my process. Anyway, the Lambus, who was a famous scientist, uh, <coughs> had connections with people in, in Eastern Europe, and a, and a friend of his told him about going to Petron. He arranged to, to uh, get financing to get Petron to come and collaborate with me uh, <coughs> on uh, using this microscope, which he had just invented, uh, as was pointed out, for biological uh, uh, purposes. So uh, this is the paper that uh, has been referred to. This is the science paper that we, we published in 1967, 50 years ago, uh, using uh, the Petron Hadrowski <laughs> microscope to uh, uh, for uh, biological specimens. We, uh, we got some pictures of uh, dorsal ganglion cells. We did a drawing. Uh, we got better represented what we were saying that we couldn't show in photographs. And it, yeah, it's, uh, pictures themselves are not terribly impressive, but it was a beginning. And uh, this is the, this is this paper that is sort of the, the keynote of the, the, uh, the 50 years that we're, we're celebrating today. Microscopy, of course, as you all know, has developed enormously since then. In any case, uh, Rather than, rather than being really, really happy uh, that, that a couple of his uh, protégés had published his paper, uh, Professor Galambos was a little bit ticked off uh, <laughs> because his name wasn't on the paper. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I don't know, again, the, the whole issue of who, whose names should go on paper is very vexed and, and an interesting one and, and not, not a simple case. I was a naive junior faculty member. I thought he was really proud of it. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think he ever really forgave me. That's a sad, sad story. It's nice, but he was really ticked off. So we published a paper before us uh, together, uh, Petron, Hedrowski, uh, Eger, and Goamos, in which I did some calculations for the Hummel Cannon Scanning Microscope work. So this was published in the Journal of the Optical Society of America. Anyway, so that's that's that. This is, I came across this, which I thought was very very funny, you can read the little squid that says it's a mammoth. <laughs> and uh, this is this is this is an illustration of some of the weaknesses of the original tandem scanning uh, microscope in that uh, very inefficient use of light and the resolution <laughs> wasn't great. This this kind of makes final it was, it's, it's actually turned out to be a useful instrument and, and Petron and Hadrowski uh, have successfully commercialized it and you can buy and it's getting microscopes and they're good for some things, but they're they're just not very efficient uses of light. And the resolution for most applications is not, not wonderful. Like they say microscopy is good for So that <coughs> leads me to the, the sequel. So I'm now gonna finish talking about scanning this microscopy and talk about where do we go from here. I'm gonna add the bicycles. And I always bike to work. I lived on Edgewood Way, and I always bike to work on my bike. And I ran into somebody else who also liked biking who lived in Westville. And it turned out to be Paul Davidovitz, who, by the way, uh, Davidovitz uh, was a junior faculty member at Yale at the time in engineering and applied science. And uh, he has an interesting background. He was born in Czechoslovakia. It's the Central European thing. Uh, was hidden during the war 
ultimately immigrated to Canada and then to Israel and then came to the United States. So he's now a professor at Boston College. Anyway, so we were talking, I told him, you know, my prosecutor, uh, thinking that we, we were doing what we were trying to do, and he thought that was interesting. And we, we, we tried a bunch, a bunch of configurations of scanning disks and so on. And nothing seemed to improve things. And then we decided, what the heck, let's try to do, use lasers. Yeah, seems obvious in retrospect. And in any case, as was mentioned, we published this paper in 1969 in Nature. Uh, it took us a couple of years to get a really good uh, working model for the scanning laser with the confocal microscope. So using Minsky's confocal idea, and similar to what Petron had done with the Canon scanning microscope, we adapted it to uh, using a laser as a light source, which of course, uh, because the uh, uh, power was so great, the, the light losses uh, are not, not, uh, not a problem. Anyway, so we, we built it, we patented it. This is, a, this is an illustration uh, from our, our patent in 1970 for the uh, scanning laser uh, confocal microscope. And uh, then we subsequently published a paper in Nature in 1973 using that microscope. And uh, these are uh, uh, photomicrographs of, of living uh, corneal cells uh, taken with a scanning laser confocal microscope. And to the best of my knowledge, maybe somebody will refute me, but to the best of my knowledge, this is the first photomicrograph of a biological specimen taken with a laser confocal scanning microscope. Maybe that's the end of the question. Thank <laughs> you.